Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to a chapter-by-chapter read-through of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. I started this off with the Two Towers months ago, and then I moved on to The Return of the King, and then in classic Steve Donahue channel fashion, I am now finishing up with the beginning of the book. <laughs> and we are starting out very small. The Lord of the Rings starts out very small. Uh, it doesn't start out, for instance, with the uh, that casta cascading epic prologue chapter that, for instance, The Wheel of Time does. The Wheel of Time uh, proper also starts out very small, a little village, small portendings of oncoming doom. But before that, there's a huge chapter with characters firing energy bolts at each other. We don't get anything like that here. Instead, we get a story about a magic ring. The magic ring that we meet in J.R.R. Tolkien's children's book, The Hobbit, which has been in the possession of a hobbit named Bilbo Baggins for decades. He leaves, and he passes it on to his cousin Frodo, who also has it for decades, until the wizard Gandalf shows up and tells him, this is actually the most dangerous ring in the world, it's the most dangerous object in the world, it is the one ring, it is the possession of the Dark Lord Sauron, who is rebuilding his power. Has been, in fact, rebuilding his power very precipitously in the time period that is covered by The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. When Gandalf isn't on the scene in The Hobbit, he is contending with the rising power of Sauron. When he leaves the Shire at the beginning of The Lord of the Rings and is gone for decades, he is contending with the power of Sauron. If you could read an account of these same years written by Gandalf, the Shire would barely get mentioned, uh, Gandalf tells Frodo all of this, and Frodo makes an essentially heroic decision. He decides, well... This makes me a danger to everyone around me. The Dark Lord knows the name Baggins. He will send his servants here. That means I have to leave to protect the Shire and my fellow hobbits, not all of whom I'm all that fond of. I have to leave. I have to go on a hero's journey. And he is accompanied by his servant, Sam. And on the road, on the way, they meet a young, their young hobbit friend, Pippin. Uh, as they make their way out of... out of... Hobbiton out, out of their local environment. None of them has ever gone very far from home. Gandalf isn't with them. He tells Frodo originally, I think you could probably do with some company on the road, but he has something to attend to first. He leaves and he misses their arranged meeting. So they're on their own. They meet a wandering band of elves, and the elves give them a very peaceful night's sleep and a bunch of provender, but no real wisdom. And that is the chapter that we're at today. The hobbits are waking up the next morning. This is chapter four, a shortcut to mushrooms. Uh, and it starts the next morning. Frodo awakens from a very peaceful sleep, and the elves are nowhere to be seen. They left during the night. Uh, and Frodo, over breakfast, complains, or rather comments, to Sam and to Pippin that Elves are pretty enigmatic. They don't usually give straightforward answers to questions that you ask them. So they're none the wiser for many of these, except for Gild, the, the elves' strict warning that they should consider themselves in danger, even though they are still in the Shire. They should consider themselves in enemy territory. And we already know this, because we've seen that they're being followed, that they're being pursued by riders in black on black horses. And in this chapter, they decide, uh, Frodo decides, they want, they're making for the nearest town, they're making for the nearest ferry, they want to get across the river, they eventually want to get to Rivendell, but their traveling needs right now are very small. They just want to get to the next landmark. And the road would take them enormously out of their way, so Frodo decides to walk overland. Even though it's rough, brambly, boggy country, and it, it might not increase their speed all that much, he still decides to do it not only because it's the more direct route, but also because it's less likely that riders on horseback will take their mounts across such territory. Uh, so they do. And they do have rough traveling of it, and we get a lot more people walking around. <laughs> uh, a couple of, I mentioned yesterday that one of the signature banes of this book for people who don't fall under its magic is how much walking around there is. There is so much walking around, and it is never ellipsed. It is always described, except when you want it to be described. When you want it to be described, it's not. What Tolkien reader anywhere in the world wouldn't give their right hand 
for 300 pages describing the wanderings around of Gandalf and Aragorn looking for Gollum. We only hear about that, and who knows what adventures they have. We never read about it. I would give a lot to read that. Uh, we get a lot of that. We get a lot of wandering around, and every once in a while, our heroes learn, still know that they are being followed. That they, There are black riders around, and the, the subtle danger here, the thing I mentioned yesterday, uh, that Tolkien really doesn't lay on very thickly, is what would happen if one of these riders found them? It would be really bad. It wouldn't be a harsh conversation, despite what we read in this chapter, because eventually, going across country, Frodo and his friends come to the farm of Farmer Maggot, who Frodo has feared forever. When he was a much younger hobbit, he stole mushrooms from Farmer Hoggett's farmland and has been afraid of this man ever since, him and his dogs. And they come to his land. Pippin knows Farmer, Farmer Maggot fairly well, so they can reasonably expect a good welcome. And, but Frodo is trepidatious anyway from old memories. It's very, very local stuff. Very local stuff. And sure enough, when they get on his land, Farmer Maggot does turn his dogs on them. I read that passage as I've read so many passages like this in so many books, in so many different fields of study, uh, about people dealing with this, about people dealing with trespassers by letting the dogs on them. And it automatically makes me think of my own traveling, of the, the years and years where I went traveling. That was the one thing I didn't have to worry about. Uh, but it turns out the Frodo doesn't need to worry about it either. Because, as he puts it, I'm sorry now that I was afraid of you all these years. I could have had a good friend. Farmer Maggot turns out not to be a horrible figure at all. He's, he's definitely uh, wary of trespassers, especially queer folk are about. And by that he means these riders in black who he's already had dealings with. One of them actually talked to him and asked him where Baggins was and said, if, if you tell me where he is, there's gold in it for you. That doesn't really square with what we're going to get later on from the, the Nazgul. I mean, these are Nazgul that we have here. It's, it's another example of how the Lord of the Rings grows epic in the telling. The Nazgul also get worse in the telling. One of them riding up to a hobbit farmer and offering to bribe him with gold isn't exactly all that forbidding, uh, especially when that rider seems to run from the dogs. Uh, Farmer Maggot has these encounters, and he tells our heroes, you know, you can stay, you can eat, and I will give you a carriage to get you the rest of your way, to get you to, you know, to the river or to the ferry that you want to reach, so you don't have to keep hiking overland. This will, it'll be, it'll be easier, it'll be better for you to do this. It, you, it'll probably dissuade riders from bothering us. Although, when they're on the road, headed in that, they gratefully accept. And when they're on the road, headed in that direction, they do encounter a rider looms up out of the shadows. But it turns out it's another young hobbit. <laughs> it's Merry. So our quartet of hobbits is now complete. We have Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin. And that is where the chapter ends. It's a, it's a fairly small chapter. Our friends are definitely still being watched. They are definitely still being pursued. And not only that, but they're being inquired about by name, by creatures that we have to assume are the servants of the enemy. Normal men don't sniff for gold, or for, or for gold rings. Or these, these, don't, these obviously aren't normal people. They're obviously these partially supernatural. For all that they seem fairly tame under the stern eye of Farmer Maggot. <laughs> but that is this chapter. It's not uh, much. It's not a very big deal. It's a little bit longer than the previous chapter, but the previous chapter had elves in it. Always a source of interest in Tolkien. Not this one. This is just our hobbits making their way overland. They decide to cut their journey by tramping through the wilderness, <laughs> and they meet a figure that Frodo had considered uh, intimidating, and it turns out he isn't. That also is going to be a pattern in this book that that reveals itself over and over again. Frodo, this is Frodo and Sam are traveling on the road. They are heading to Rivendell. Of course, this is long before there is a Fellowship of the Ring. But it is a pattern of the book that Frodo and Sam are going to be wandering across country. They're going to wander literally across almost all the width of Middle-earth, from the, the west coast all the way to Mordor. We don't know what lies west of Mordor, or east of Mordor. We don't, we're never told much about that. It's a whole other world. Or south. 
much south. We're dealing with a little area very congruent with Europe. Uh, but in that pattern, that's two patterns. Sam and Frodo will be wandering around. And occasionally they will meet help where they least expect it. Farmer Maggot is the very first example of that if you don't count the elves. I think we assume that the elves will be helpful. Uh, but where, Farmer Maggot is a good example of a potential threat that turns out to be a help. And that's going to stay true all the way to the end. So in this sense, there is a tedious undergraduate literary paper to be written about the parallels between Farmer Maggot and Faramir. <laughs> I hope you don't do that. I hope nobody does that. <laughs> but that's the chapter for today. We're going to move on next time. Uh, and I will wrap this up for now. I will see you then. Thank you, book two.